Hey folks, in today's episode, we're going to talk to you about what we've been playing, uh, The Adventurers, Temple of Chalk, Horrified, and The Networks. And then in our Espresso episode, we're going to give you our recap of Dragon Con and Escape Winter Con 2022. Stick around. You're listening to the Beans and Dice podcast, a podcast about how we game. Hey, folks, thanks for sticking around for our next episode. And before we get into what we've been playing, let me introduce who I got with me today. I'm Carlos. We've got Rob and Wayne of the Beans and Dice podcast to come to you and give you a quick espresso episode, quick express episode on what kind of our, our recap for recent conventions that we've gone to. This is why Mitch is not with us. Unfortunately, he hasn't been to a convention recently. So I'm glad to have Wayne. Thanks for showing up. Thanks. Rob, glad to always see you. As always. Let's start off with a little bit about what we've been playing. I love been that. Been playing. Loving it. What you got, Wayne? So, uh, yeah, this weekend got a couple of good games in. A uh, friend had a birthday party, so I had a bunch of people over. And one of our buddies is one of those guys that's got that, you know, 2,500 board game collection and never brings the same game twice. So it's always fun to play something new. This this week we played, um, the one I'm going to highlight is actually an older game. Uh, 2009, The Adventurers, The Temple of Chalk. Um, weight is 1.66 on BGG. It's got a 6.6 .6 rating. The designer is... Um, Guillaume Blossier and Frederick Henry. Um, really, this is uh, Indiana Jones, the board game. You're, you're basically, you have these cool little miniatures. You're starting out on a board, and you're, you're basically trying to run through sort of a temp, the Temple of Chalk and collect treasure tokens. Uh, the first sort of uh, piece you go through is a collapsing wall that's closing in on you, and you can stay in that little zone long enough to... Uh, flip over tiles to f solve a puzzle later in the game to get more treasure, or you can run through it before the walls crash on you. Then once you get through that, there's a boulder rolling behind you, and you're, every, every round the dice is rolling and the boulder's coming after you. Uh, then you can kind of either go around the long way for some treasure or go through that maze if you stayed in the collapsing wall room long enough. Uh, then you can kind of either swim through uh, underground t treasure trove or go around. It's basically just a, it's a one lap around the board, um, moving your guys, deciding how much you want to risk pulling treasures uh, to get out. And so it's really, really light. It's a simple game. It's, it's a game that you can play with kids really young. Probably It says 10 plus, but you could play six, seven, eight plus easy. Um, you know, and if you die once, if you, if you get crushed or rolled over by the boulder or whatever, you, you, there's an option for bringing a second character. Um, it's, it's out of print, which is a little mad because <laughs> I'm like looking at the prices on eBay and, 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 and BGG and it's like going for like a hundred or $200. Uh, but it was, it was really fun, light game. Uh, and it was like a filler game. We played it. It says 45 minutes. I think we played it at 30. Uh, so it's a game that we kind of played two or three times during the game day, uh, in between other longer games, uh, which I'll save those longer games for future podcasts. But um, so it was a fun game. The production value, the toy value was pretty high <clears throat> for a 2009 game. Definitely. The, the minis and the figures and kind of the, the, the stuff there uh, was pretty impressive for a game from 2009. Uh, but certainly I don't, it's out of print now. So the, val the, the price that it's selling for is um, definitely probably more than I would pay for it. So uh, all in all, a fun game. If it's in a library at a convention, or you know somebody would have it. It's a good filler game. It's a good game to play with kids because it really is just Indiana Jones the game, um, and it's so it's fun. But definitely not the worth the two hundred dollars. Some of them are going for on Amazon, but uh, uh, fun light game, and it was enjoyable. Yeah. Did you say that there's an element of push your luck to it? Yeah, it's like the longer. Well, it is sort of like so. The in, initial, in the first little area, there's like walls that are closing in on you, and so every turn you stay in there, the walls potentially could move closer in. But the longer you stay in there, you can flip over tiles to understand the little maze later in the board. And there are, in the maze, there are only four tiles that are dangerous. And if you know those four tiles, then you can get your way through it and collect a lot of treasure. Or you can avoid that maze completely and go around the long way. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely some push your luck. And, like, in, in, the, in the river area, you can take time to dive underwater but the longer you go to dive underwater, the longer it takes you out of the river, the harder it is to get back out of the river because you have all this treasure weighing you down. So there's there's some pushing your luck here and there, uh, and there's certainly some analysis of which direction you want to go uh, the long way around or take shortcuts. So I'm going to say that's given me a feeling of uh, of Clank. I mean, it, it seems like that, uh, uh, like in Clank, you're trying to go down, you're trying to get 
push your luck a little bit there with the treasure before the dragon wakes up and kills everybody you know, with this boulder coming after you. And, and you mentioned how you can collect more treasure and kind of push your luck and stay down there. I mean, that definitely seems to have that feeling. Did you, You've played Clank, yeah, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I played, it's sort oh, yeah. of like that. Yeah, Clank is definitely okay. a little bit, a way more complex. But this is, okay. so this is basically just a, a once around the board. You start on one corner gotcha. of the board, and you, you go through the, the, the tunnel, then you avoid the... The boulder, and you, you loop around all the different tropes, all from the different these adventure tro- movies. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, you go through, and then and then basically you get out, and you know a couple of times guys push their luck or stay behind and got stuck behind the boulder, and the boulder eventually just crushes, and and you're stuck in the temple, right? Or you know you, you can't get back out. So you, most of the time, one or two of the players died, brought in a second character, or you know it was good, but it was it was off. You know it was really fun, light, quick game. We you could crank out a game of this in thirty minutes, and so it was, it was good for the toy value. So as far as you like, talk about the toy value, because it, it's the and again, this is an audio medium, so people, right. people can't see what we're looking at, but it's got uh, plastic walls. It's got uh, a plastic like a boulder that rolls around and miniatures. So it's very much uh, like a diorama. Yeah. And for 2009, pretty, pretty cool. I mean, I'm pretty impressed with the production value of a 2009 game. Um, I, I would come out today. I'm sure it would be even better than this, but uh yeah, you said it was in general, like, you know, we, we do the whole buy, try, deny. I would absolutely try this. I would not buy it for the $200 it's going on Amazon or the, you know, $100. It's definitely, but, it, you know, it's a fun game. And I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure it's like in the Dice Tower library and things like that. But um, hopefully this is the kind of game that I could see getting a reprint or, you know, with some some newer figures and stuff. Because it, like I said, a nice, light, fun game that a family could play that, that, ties into those Indiana Jones troops tropes that that really is just you know a little fun filler with more production value cool and the aesthetics are to me because uh, the designer uh, he, uh Frederick Henry and uh Guillaume Blusier they're French like it's you can, this whole game speaks like French style art to me uh the art the the characters the way they're drawn uh, it it's very strong in its theme. I like it. Yeah, the, the miniatures are pretty cool looking. Um, they, they are definitely kind of like unique characters that definitely kind of has sort of that like that French art style that you would see in some of, of the like the cartoons, the French cartoons and stuff. Well, I'll, I'll take us to our next bean playing game. Um, I really want to highlight our my recent plays, first time of Horrified. So I had an opportunity to play Horrified with the family uh, at least two or three times now in the last two weeks. Horrified is a title from 2019, published by Prospero Hall, and it's a cooperative game, in the, almost like in the vein of a pandemic-style cooperative game, where you're running around to different locations in order to take different activities to help stop the baddie from reaching the end of the baddie track, thus ending the game, right? Like, that's the generic how-to-play basics of it. But what I really, really liked about Horrified is the enemy is going to be two different monsters from the options in the game. So they believe there's six or so monsters in the game. So you're going to get these different scaling of difficulty and theming. Right? So like Dracula, you've got to find all his coffins throughout the board, gather enough items that are able to destroy coffins to destroy his coffin, to then once all his coffins are destroyed, the four of them, you can then attack Dracula directly. Uh, another example is Frankenstein's monster and the Bride of Frankenstein. That's another monster. It's a pair of them together, but that's a monster. And the way you're going to defeat them is by working on their humanity. You're trying to increase their humanity so that when you connect the two of them together, bring them the two of them together, they fall in love and go away. Right, because now they have some humanity, and then they fall in love with each other, and they go away. So that's the idea of the, the way you defeat different monsters or villains in Horrified. The theme is coming through so strong when you play this game. It just feels so good. But the rule set is so light that my 11-year-old instantly was able to, to pick up on how to play and provide strategy and involvement. When it comes to Horrified... If, if we're going by try or deny, like right off the bat, I'm going by. Unless you are someone who hates co-ops in general i'm gonna say buy uh, buy because the alpha gamer syndrome isn't as strong here each of you're gonna have cards even if you do want to try to tell everyone what to do the game isn't so difficult that you have to you can kind of let people make a few mistakes 
but don't let that go on too long because it'll ramp up quick and and kick you in the face. Next thing you know, that terror track has ended and you lost the game. So that's horrified by Prospero Hall, uh, designed yeah, designed by Prospero Hall. They like, and that's the weird part about Prospero. They got like a group of people that design. They don't really give you a name of a designer to go to. Yeah, and th- this isn't one that I've not played, but I I know I've seen it at Target, and I've seen it at Target on sale, like you know, for like twenty bucks, right, or even less probably. So this is definitely, you know, like you said, it's a buy, and I think it's. Um, you know, if you get it at a sale at Target, when they have the two for one or they have a discounted, you can pick this up pretty pretty cheap. And so, even if it's not a game that hits the table super often, uh, it's a game that that's worth having because you know cooperative games can be fun, especially when you have kids. Yeah, I played this one twice now, I think. And uh, you, you talk about the difficulty, though. The difficulty we we do need to state the difficulty does scale because the difficulty is based on how many bad monsters, how many bad guys, how many monsters you put in the game. And so you can actually ramp it up. If you play with uh, four or five monsters, the game becomes very difficult. And it does, at that point, uh, you, you really can't make mistakes. You really have to nail a lot of things. So just depending. But if you play you know, the basic way, the learner way, it, it, is, it is easy enough to certainly be a family le- weight game, family level game. But uh, you can definitely turn it up a few notches if you, if you just throw a couple extra bad guys in there. So, yeah. Um, I can jump over next to uh, to my recent play, The Networks. Uh, it's a game that I owned for a couple of years. I picked it up a while back on a uh, recommendation through the Dice Tower. Uh, I saw a really good review of it, uh, even though the game had been out for a while. Uh, it's actually a 2016 release. And so I picked it up just off of the Dice Tower recommendation a couple of years ago, but it sat on my shelf of opportunity until uh, fairly recently, actually, uh, Wayne introduced uh, us to it. He taught uh, me and a couple other people came over to his house, but well, that was probably, what, a couple of months ago, and uh, Wayne ran us through the paces on it. And, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a fun game. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I'd say it's a little bit crowd-dependent. I've played it three times now, and uh, depending on, you know, you, you, get, you need to play with people who kind of are going to get into it a little bit and, and enjoy it, but you're, you're programming a, a, a television station, and so you start out with these real generic, really bad uh, three, you know, three different time slots, and you're trying to slot in different shows and um, you start out with these three I mean, they, they all have little funny names on them uh, I'm trying to remember the names of some of them but uh, they're, they're really uh, we, we, when we play I always ask people to read out uh, the names of the shows and then as you're as you're upgrading these sorry, shows you're, as you're focused on theme what uh, yeah, exactly. I know it's, it's uh, unusual. It's this new territory for me, so uh, give me a break. But uh, as you're slotting in these new shows, you're you're retiring old shows, you're putting them into reruns, and you're putting new shows in. And as you put in these shows, you can actually also uh, draft or buy contracts for stars and then you can buy advertisements that help you offset because if you have uh, high level stars in your show they get you more viewers so they get you more victory points but then they're going to cost you they're going to have a salary every year or every season that they're on the show you're going to have to pay them money out of your out of your coffers and so you can actually buy advertising and then you can slot advertising into these shows which makes you money at the end of every season so it's really thematic but the advertisements have little funny names on them the stars have funny names Names. I remember there's there's the one that's the guy that yells all the time. There's that comedian that my parents love or whatever. And so there are these funny little ones. And so you're putting them in and then they have different genres of the shows. There's comedy, there's romance, there's sports shows. And so you get little bonuses if you can get multiple shows and retire them and get them to your reruns and then into your archives uh, in groups of three or five. And so uh, this was a, a, a fun fun little game. Actually, I liked it quite a bit more than I thought I was going to. Uh, I have not played it with the expansion yet. I believe the Executives, I think, is the big expansion. I think there's actually two expansions. There's one called the Executives that everybody says, once you play with that one, you'll kind of never go back. And so I actually own that. I need to mix that in and try that at some point. But uh, just looking at the BGG on it real quick, 7.2 rating says one to five players i've played it at four and five now i don't think i've played it with anything less than than four players uh says 60 to 90 minutes i'd say when you know the game that's that's certainly uh, i think you can knock this out in an hour with three or four people who know how to play it the weight's a 2.59 so it's not particularly heavy um it's it's kind of a a good middleweight game designer uh gil hova h-o-v-a i think i'm saying that right artist travis uh, kinchy and this one published by Board and Dice. Um, so I'm finding as I play more games from Board and Dice, I'm liking their stuff quite a bit. But again, this one a little older, released 2016. And uh, I, I've played this uh, when I played it at the convention this last weekend. Uh, the group I played with all 
uh, I'd say two of the people that I played with had played it and two had not. And the two that had played it said, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is a fun game. We like pulling this one out and, and playing it. And the two people we introduced it to both liked it quite a bit as well. It's uh, not, not real heavy. Like I say, it's a fairly light game. But uh, it's a lot of fun. And if you play it with the right crowd, people who kind of get into it a little bit, kind of read out the story, read out the, the shows that they're putting in and the, the stars they're putting in there, the advertisements they're putting in there, it, it actually can be, be kind of funny and, and be a good time. So, but yeah, what do you, what do you think, Wayne? I know you've, yeah. you've played it quite a bit. I played it. Yeah, it's a really, really fun game. I think uh, what you said, you hit the nail on the head. It's a, it's a fun game. It's, it's got really cool kind of like gameplay. But if you get into it and you start like reading off the shows and making the funny jokes and things like that, it yeah. gets even better. Uh, the executives is a really good expansion. It you know it gives you more play individual kind of player more asynchronous kind of player powers as opposed to just all kind of having a similar network. And then the other big expansion is Telly Time, which is it uh, gives you it replaces all the shows um, from American. Basically, all the shows are spoofs on American shows, so they take you know all the. The Lost and Friends and Seinfeld, there's versions of those in there. And Telly Time is basically all BBC and British ones. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun game. Um, Makes sense, it, yeah. It's not super complex, but it's, it's got some, some challenge to it. Um, and yeah, Gil Hova is good. I think it's, it's boards and dice, but it's also formal ferret games is, is Gil's actual game company. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. he used, he used to be on the, um, uh, the Ludology podcast for a lot of years. Uh, and so I, I, I liked his games. He does a couple of cool games that he's got out there, but this is probably his best one. Now you talked about the complexity of it, right? Cause I, I've seen this game played Robert at dice tower, probably dice tower, 2016, 2017. Um, okay. when the, I think the games are around that time when it came out. Yeah. And seeing everything laid out on the board kind of shied me away from the game because it looked complex on the board. When I see all the, the player mats and all the spaces and then you get the cards with all the symbology, it yeah, just it, yeah. it's it a little deceptive. looked it, complex. Yeah, there, but you said really, it was light, middle light? What do you mean? Yeah, I, it's, it's really, you know, I see what you, when I'm looking at the BGG pictures here, there are a lot of little things, but it, it's really just a score track and then it's, it tells you how to set up the cards for each round because uh, depending on the number of players, there can be a different number of, of the star cards and the advertising cards and then the programming cards that you put out. And so um, that really is all that, you know, I'm looking at all this stuff that it really looks a lot more convoluted than it is. It's, it's a fairly light game. I mean, really all you're yeah, doing because it was, is... it was Ryan and Brad, uh, Brad yeah. Payne, Bradley Payne okay, and, yep. and Ryan Guy. Right, they had that. Yep. picked it up at, at Dice Tower like 2017 or something. It was early uh, yep. when this game recently had come out. And I, I saw them playing. I'm like, oh, that just it looks cute, but it looks too complex for that cuteness. Well, I think you know what it is. It's it's just, like Rob said. It's deceptive because when you actually start playing it, I think this game does a better job than a lot of games. Of once you have it laid out, you, you rule book you don't need because all right. the all the round future rounds and all the setup and anything you do is right there laid out. It's it's fairly uh, clean iconography and sort of very easy to understand once you go. Okay, I get the setup now. I'm good to go. So it really is. You know, it's it does a yeah. better job of most games than of. I don't need the rule book once I lay it out because once I have it set up, everything's there. Yeah, it's one of these games. Once you play the first round, uh, it looks like when, you know, it was a, we played a five-player game, and I believe that's five rounds plus kind of a bonus round at the end, a half a round. But uh, once you play the first round or even the first couple of moves, everybody gets it. It's like, oh, okay, I'm just buying this stuff. I'm slotting it in. So, you know, occasionally I'm moving a, a program from one side of my board to the other side of the board, kind of retiring it and putting it into reruns. But it's it's got real simple mechanics, and uh, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to play some time. And I, maybe I our, our knowledge time. base, our schema of TV and shows will make the game run smoother than we would think if we had no idea how reruns work or putting yeah. a show in syndication. Like yep. The fact that we grew up in America knowing that makes the mechanics match Intuitive. the theme, which yeah. hearing Rob talk about reading the theme off the cards, you know, this is the guy who oh, struggles yeah. <laughs> for me to get him to read any flavor text out of Lords of Waterdeep. And that, that's a big part of this game. I mean, you, you kind of almost have to do that because if you don't, I, I would say it, it gets a little dull because, again, all you're doing is just buying a card, slotting it in. So you kind of you kind of got to add to that by uh, by getting into it a little bit. So yeah, well, hearing about you doing that makes it that this game is going back onto the list of yeah. desired games to play. It yeah. was there before. I saw it on the table and said, nah, I'm never going to play that. I'm not going to worry about it. But no, now we'll it's going it. back on the list. So good good share. Yeah, for sure. We'll they, get with Wayne since Wayne knows it so well. Yep, yeah. I have it. And I have all the expansions, and they have a card for the IT crowd, man. 
<laughs> oh, there you go. Sweet. They do? They do. You can play the IT crowd. You can <laughs> You're going to have to take that out of the telly experience? No, they, have it, in the, they have it in both. They have it in... He, it was in the base Oh, that's game right. We did have our yeah. horrible American version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we could get that one on uh, on stream. Play it on, on stream. Yeah, now for that sure. The studio set up for more gaming than it is for studio. That'd be fun. I think that wraps up our uh, bean playing. That's what we... Being play. I love how you guys came up with these puns. I really do. Oh, yeah. Punny. Dad jokes. All right. In, in lieu of a dice strategies segment, we're going to focus this episode on keeping it quick and espresso. Nice little cafecito, as we call it. Just a quick, fast cafecito of a shot of an episode. We're just going to give you a quick rundown on our uh, recent conventions that we've gone to. Uh, I know Wayne went a little farther than Robert and I. Robert and I got to go to Escape WinterCon. Uh, Wayne got to go to Dragon Con. So um, I think in this format, let's talk a little bit about our traveling to the con. Let's give folks experience on what it's like to prepare and travel to the con and then the experiences that we had at the con and kind of give our overall thoughts of that con. So, Wayne, if you want to share a little bit about what your plans Dragon, were and yeah. how you executed on it for Dragon Con. So, yeah, I mean, uh, travel is interesting, especially when you're going to go to a big convention. Like, if you're going to go Gen Con, S, and Comic Con, Dragon Con. Um, as example, Dragon Con this year had 65,000 people. Uh, and so, normally, they have 80, 85, 90,000, something in that range. So, one, it's a huge amount of people. And you're talking about, it's going to take you like a half day to even just get checked in, you know. Uh, so, you, you take a flight. Uh, we flew up to Atlanta like 6 a.m. You take the MARTA into the main part of the city, and Dragon Con takes over like like the 10 largest hotels in downtown Atlanta. And so you have, you know, uh, I, I was checking into the Hilton Hotel. It's a 45-story or something, 25-story hotel. So you're talking about thousands of people checking into a hotel same day. Um, so you just got to like, you know, you check, put your luggage at the bellhop, and you say, I'll come back later when it's died down because the lines are too long. And you go get your badge and just picking up the badge. You know, it's about an hour, hour and a half wait to get your badge, you know, and that's a probably a pretty, pretty consistent. I mean, the line never stops moving, but you're talking about the line is wrapped around like two city blocks twice and you walk out and you walk around and then you go get your badge and, and then you're good to go for the rest of the con. It's a five day con. So an hour and a half wait, not too bad, but I mean, it's even more worse if you go to some like Gen Con. Yeah, I didn't even or, think about that, Robert. Yeah. When Robert and I went back in 2019, we were working for Cool Stuff, Cool Stuff Inc. We were uh, doing some volunteer hours. All we yep. had to do was show up to the hall, <laughs> text them. They came out yep. and said, "All right, here's your <laughs> here's your, here's badge, your, yeah. your press badge or if you work uh, for the uh, con, vendor yeah, badge." They, yep, yep. Yeah, I have they, my my friend was working the con and he didn't have to wait in the line with us. But you know, an hour hour and insane. a half wait is about you know, hey. That's what it and is, we got right? To, we got to go in the little back entrance to the uh, exhibitor hall. We didn't even have to <laughs> wait out there with the, the regular slows at all. Yeah, <laughs> with the plebes, right? But no, <laughs> <Wow>. so, <laughs> but you go, you know. So then you go back later in the day and, and you check into your hotel room, and we checked in, and then you go out and start partying and gaming and going to panels and and stuff like that. And you know, Dragon Con there is a large gaming area, but typically I don't get very much gaming in at Dragon Con. I've talked about that before. It's usually there's so much else going on there between the celebrities and the bands and the, the how to panels and the science panels and the meeting, you know, all that kind of stuff and the dealer rooms that are massive that there's just too much to do to really concentrate too much on gaming. It, like I have other cons that like local cons or small, like you guys are going to talk about what you guys went to is the perfect, you just game the whole week. That's all you got to do. Nothing else but game. Whereas with dragon con, there's just, I mean, you can go to a dance party, you can go meet a celebrity you can go listen to a NASA scientist or a former CIA agent or listen to a guy who works for Hollywood prop building or, you know, actually it's funny. So the city of Atlanta is not a small city. It's a big city. The, the, the Dragon Con has a parade of all the cosplayers have a parade. And it's literally the largest parade in the city of Atlanta all year. So it's bigger than the, their, their Thanksgiving Day parade. It's bigger than their Fourth of July parade. The Dragon Con parade is the largest parade in the city of Atlanta. That just goes to show you how much they've kind of embraced that nerd culture. And I think it's even better now that, you know, Disney and all those, uh, all that stuff's getting shot right there in Georgia. So there's always stuff, you know, there. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Five days of, of staying up late, partying, going to, going to like different dance parties, going to different bands. Uh, but during the day, you can do a lot of cool stuff. Like I said, you know, I met with. Where'd uh, you guys was, stay at? We stay at the Hilton. 
the main the main hotel. There's there's four main hotels: the Marriott, the Hilton, the Hyatt, and the Westin. And then they also take over like six or seven more hotels in that area. And what's pretty cool is they're all connected by sky bridges now, so you don't even really have to walk outside in the heat and the rain and stuff like that. So you can go from all four hotels to the convention center, you know, and the, and the, they have the dealer room, they have the convention center, they have the game room, they have a huge arcade with like all the Japanese style arcade games. They have a, an old school arcade game and pinball area. They have a miniatures painting area. So the, there's literally, if you're into anything nerdy, geeky, fun, whatever, there's something at Dragon Con for you. It's not specific to board games. It's not specific to anime. It's not specific like some of the other conventions on. It's basically just a, a holistic of you'll find something that you're into going on at any moment in time. It's it's yeah, a lot of fun. The vendor areas there were, were awesome, too. I remember just uh, that whole vendor hall, multi-floors, uh, the artists, the comic book stuff going on, the board game stuff. Just, oh, man, just, walking uh, through those the vendors with the, the art alone yeah. that, yes. that, that they're selling that they created is just amazing. Yeah, we, we bought some art. My, my wife and I buy some art every year. And then actually the comic book vendors, I love, so yeah, there's four floors of comic, of, of dev vendor rooms, dealers, art, artist alley. You can meet with the comic book artists. And then they have a whole other art show which with way more professional art and craziness, but I really like the, uh, the comic book area because, you know, you have some famous comic book people. Like, unfortunately, my wife used to always get a photo with George Perez. He passed away this past year. George Perez is very famous for doing Wonder Woman and a lot of other comic books, and she's a big Wonder Woman fan. Uh, but we met some other young aspiring artists and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. I, I picked up some comic books. Um, oh, what's it? Something Tuskegee. It's based on the Tuskegee Airmen, but it's not. It's like futuristic. And they're like little, like they're like aliens have invaded, and uh, it's a pretty cool story. But so aliens have invaded. No one can fly. So these little kids find the old P fifty one Lightnings, and they're flying them, and they're fighting aliens and stuff. And they're based. So they're they're throwing an homage back to Tuskegee Airmen. So it was cool just talking with the artist and and the the writer. And so we, I there was four issues out. And I said I'll buy them, and got they signed it, no problem. So it was kind of cool. And, brought it home for my kid to read because he you know it's it's cool for him to read something about like you know about that so yeah it, so you can find kind of cool niche things like that at dragon con all right dragon con 2022 uh if, if wayne would have to rate that it sounds like it would be a buy because it doesn't matter what you're into yeah. there's something for you at <laughs> dragon con yeah, it was good yeah and i'll say this they they they, they kind of capped attendance a little bit uh, they didn't allow a lot of single day ticket sales, which was good. I think that they need to go back to that more often. That this because Saturdays used to get insane, um, and and it was you know hey sixty five thousand people. They did require masks. Um, I would say ninety five percent of the people were wearing their masks, and no one really had an issue with it. And there's been some cases of COVID here and there, and we knew one person close to us that tested positive for COVID. But really, for the amount of people that were there for five days straight you're not hearing about, you know, a lot of major sickness. So I think people really kind of were safe and, and had a good time while still enjoying, you know, some, some safety. So it was cool. Yeah. Going from a big con to a little con, uh, Carlos and I were able to uh, to get to a, a local con here in Orlando, the Escape Winter Convention. I know we've had Patrick Haybert on the, the call-in show a couple weeks ago. We talked to him about uh, the uh, the ups and the downs, the joys and the hardships of running a, a, a small con uh, comparatively to Dragon Con. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, they said they were selling, I think it was 500 tickets. Is that what you'd heard, Carlos, or did you hear? Yes, that's what I recall, somewhere in the, in the, in the realm of that 500. Okay. And I know uh, just uh, somebody had had posted up. It's a uh, it's a five day convention. It was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Carlos and I were only able to attend one day. We just went on Saturday. Um, on Saturday, uh, I, well, I was going to say I they I know that somebody had asked. I think on Thursday if there were still tickets available because they ad- they they advertise ahead of time that you really can't get tickets at the door. I know Patrick said there was only a couple of tickets left, so I'm going to assume they were. I think the Wednesday stuff. before, yeah. or the. The we- the week before, so that early week before the con started on Wednesday was only yeah. two tickets left. Okay, so it was. Uh, so I, 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 I it would was say good. it was dang near a sellout. Yeah, pretty much a sellout. And so uh, I would say when we went on Saturday, I was a little surprised. Um, they did downsize a little bit from where we went last year. I know last year it was still uh, kind of COVID, a lot of COVID stuff going on, and so it was uh, it felt really empty. They they did take up less space this year. They one of the big uh, convention areas, one of the big gaming areas, uh, was closed this time, and I don't I didn't see it opened all at least on Saturday. So I, I think they downsized a bit up for that. But the uh, the main room was fairly busy. Um, it, it wasn't ever packed.
fact, um, as far as just talking about safety, they did have an area that was uh, mask only that uh, you could go to if you if you wanted to play with others who were uh, who were guaranteed to be wearing a mask. Uh, I didn't really go into that area. We stayed, I think, uh, in the main hall there, which was mask optional. And there were definitely some people walking around with masks, but I'd say 90 percent of people probably were not. And uh, again, I didn't. I haven't heard anything post con about any uh, any big outbreaks or anything like that. So um, probably sounds like a very different experience than what Wayne had at Dragon Con. But uh, uh, it was it was fun. We got uh, we got games in. As as Wayne mentioned, this one definitely is all about playing. It's twenty four seven for the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and into Sunday. Um, it's it's twenty four five, I guess, um, by just playing games. And so they did have a flea market. Uh, they had uh, some giveaways. They had some game shows that they ran with some prizes. Uh, we didn't really get into any of that. Uh, we arrived what Saturday uh, morning, and this one uh, is is close enough that we can drive. It's probably with with the traffic. Saturday morning was about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and forty five minutes at least for me to get there. And then I met up with Carlos. He got there a little bit before I did Saturday morning. I know you got there just before the uh, the flea market started. Is that right? Yeah, my my goal was to get out there, attend the flea market, kind of uh, sell some coasters, get you know, kind of get a feel for what the community wants because you know I've been doing that whole Glowforge laser cut stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to get out there Saturday morning for the flea market, and then spend the afternoon uh, enjoying some games and also getting some video of the con, which I was able to post up in our on the YouTube for yep. the Beans and Dice YouTube, uh, a small sights and sounds video, so you can get a better idea of what it looked like and felt like in there. Um, I want to get some points in that Rob talked about with regards to the attendance and the the feeling, right? You watch the video, it's gonna feel empty. It's gonna but it's because the first time we went, twenty twenty was the first time. Uh, right. Patrick ran the convention as the Dice Tower convention for years. And that was thirty five hundred people. So he's not a stranger to running large cons. I think thirty five hundred to me is a pretty large con. Uh, but when Dice Tower broke off to do their own thing, he created the Escape WinterCon convention in 2020, February 2020, which happened to be the first inaugural year and also the the weird wow, wow. year where everything got <laughs> shut down. So that was probably the last event we did before the, we recognized the world went to crap. Yep. Uh, but it's the same location. So it's the same big halls, same big rooms, but now we're, con- we're reducing the amount of people that we're allowing to attend. So 500 people in that same area in these big rooms really makes it feel empty, which is sad because the perception is, oh, this is not desired, not highly attended, not enthusiastic, but really there are 500 people here. We're just really spread out. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, and that was definitely the feeling I got a little bit, which was a little disappointing. And I know I talked to a couple of people that were like, wow, you know, this doesn't feel packed. It doesn't feel like, you know, like that. Like there's a whole bunch of people here playing games. But there really was, like you say, you know, I, I, I'd say there was probably on Saturday, there was over 300 people there uh, for sure. Uh, it was probably between three and 400 people. You know, if you sell 500 tickets, not everybody's going to be there all the time. And, but but there were, you know, that especially that main gaming room, that would say that's a large room. And even with 300 people in there, it, it felt a little spacious. It felt a little empty. So, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I had a good time. But, I mean, uh, you know, and that's purposeful yeah. and appreciated, especially sure. when, you know, we got to play games and we were not, not you know, uh, nuts to butts, I'll say, with oh, yeah. other people, like, right up on us while we're gaming, yeah. which is yeah. what I'm used to with a gaming con. We had tables around us that were empty. It was nice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'd say, like, even yep. even though the world is mostly back to normal, it's still, you know, hey, having it in a big ball room and being yep. able to space out, that only helps out, you know. And, and I, th- I know that they're talking about he's got another one, another one next. They're going to do it again next February, this February. So a quick turnaround, which is back great. to back February, to, back to winter, back to yeah, February, back to which is great. Yeah. And they, he's they've said that this is the last year of the contract in their current facility. So next, you know, in 2024, you may see Escape Winter Con in either a different facility, smaller, or going back to growing the convention. And I think there's an appetite for conventions to grow. So, uh, you know, especially with the explosion of the board gaming world. But that location has growing. plenty of room to grow. Yeah. That location. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know a lot of people aren't as happy with that location. But, Rob, you tell me. I'll tell you my thoughts, and you, you give me your position. Wayne's not been there yet. I love that location. Now, oh, yeah. we live in Tampa, so we can drive over there and drive back. We don't have to stay there. We can go all every day just driving there and back. But, I mean, the, the options for food alone, you know, you're yeah. smack in the middle of Orlando's International Drive, which has all the food spots. 
you're walking distance from a food plaza with like yeah. walk-ons and Red Robins and BJ's and Perkins, I mean you name the restaurant two, and it's walking yeah, pie, distance yep. from yeah, the hotel. Okay. And I mean I didn't call this show Beans and Dice for no reason. I like food, okay? Like your foods. You know, yeah. food matters. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, for sure. Rob and, uh, and Ed Ward are busting out granola bars and pop tarts. So I'm like, nah, oh, yeah. bro, I'm gonna uh, go. I'm not, eat. I'm not leaving the game in area. Yeah, but I think the something. biggest the biggest complaint I heard was just the the quality of the rooms at the hotel. So by because we live close and can drive over, we probably don't get to see that. But like, really, like as as long as it's not like a like a Roach Motel, Roach Motel, like, yeah. like it's just a bed to sleep in, right? And you're gaming like you're gonna game 18 hours a day anyway, right? If you're at a game yeah. convention like this, if I'm at a board game convention like that where I'm gaming. Dude, if I'm gonna be so tired, I could sleep on a cardboard mat, yeah. you know, type thing yeah. at the end of the night. So it doesn't have to be like a luxury. I don't need a luxury suite. I need a cheap room that I can go crash in for four or five hours, so that I can yep. turn around and get back to gaming. You know, yep. and so that's, that's about it. For I don't recall the hours. room being terrible. We did stay there the first year, 2020. I brought the family out there. We got the suite with the bunk beds for the kiddos, right? And then Rob was coming. Uh, Rob was last minute joining us. Uh, so I, I gave him one of the bunks. I told him, you know, pick a bunk, top or bottom, and the kids gave him a bunk. So he bunked on a cardboard, basically a cardboard yeah, bed. Cardboard box, but yeah. I don't recall the room being terrible. It wasn't no. it wasn't stellar, but it wasn't terrible. Yeah. yeah, it was a room. Yeah. It was a room. And we slept a little bit, got up, game some more. Yeah. I think yep. some people have an overinflated sense of what they want their hotel rooms to be like, you know, and, and – not I also want gonna... affordable too. Yeah, exactly. When I don't you got need... a family of five, I needed to kind of be in that affordable range, especially for a five day con. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. not going to be able to do 400 bucks a night for a five day con. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. Speaking of the uh, the distance and the in the in the room and all that, uh, so I, I got in there. I don't know what time you got there. Probably a little after what 10 o'clock. Yeah, it was right about 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. I got there a little after you, probably 10 30, 10 45. It was right before the uh, the flea market started at 11. I know when I got there, you were pretty much heading in to, to run your table at the flea market. Registration and, was nothing like what Wayne had to deal with. Oh, no, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I know when I got there, it was just walk right up and <laughs> front of the line. Yep. So, but we, it was a Saturday of a con that started on Wednesday. So that's probably not not too unexpected. But uh, I uh, I know you left a little early. You got a, you got the flea market done. We got a couple of games in. We'll just hit those real quick here in just a minute. But then I know I stayed until uh, it was about two thirty in the morning on Sunday morning before I really the car you and did drove back. Yeah, I got roped into uh, a game you of, were uh, nuts. Western Legends. We did a six player game of Western Legends, and uh, about four hours in, we finally called it when nobody had wanted it. Four hours in, and I, I mentioned I was like, "Hey guys, I got to drive back to Tampa tonight." So yeah, I had a, about an hour and fifteen minute drive home at uh, at about two thirty in the morning. So that was. That was fun, but again, close enough to where you can do that. So uh, that's that's the, one of the beauties about a local con going going local. And I mean, it's it's nice if we want to stay the night, we can get a room and stay the night. But in this case, I had things I had to get done on Sunday, so I knew I had to come home. So uh, um, it's the same reasons we're not attending Dice Tower Retreat this year because it's back in Miami. Back in Miami, when Dice Tower yeah, Retreat was in Orlando. Yeah, we could plan to at least go once or twice on a drive, but you know, or stay. Our choice depending on on. Life matters. Yeah, here in Miami is about four hours. Here to Orlando is a little over an hour. So yeah, quite a difference. So, and then just before I forget, I just want to hit the games that I played here. Uh, I know you got a few games in as well. Um, I played uh, Cat in the Box. Um, that was all the rage at Gen Con this year. That's the new uh, trick taking game. It's definitely unique. We're not going to get into the details, but uh, I, I give it a. Uh, I only played it two player, and two player was okay. There are alternate rules for two player in any game where I crack it open and I read the rules, and it gives you an alternate rule set for two player versus everything else. Uh, I think you are usually going to get kind of a, uh, a pared down experience of the game. I, I think it's really going to shine at four or five players, and so I can't wait to play this with a higher player count. But uh, it was okay at two player, but it, it's going to be a completely d different game. It, it plays up to five. I, I think it'll be a completely different game at five. Uh, just real quick, Lords of Waterdeep, Scoundrels of Skullport. First time Carlos and I had both played that, and we both enjoyed that. I'll let him to talk a little more about that if he if he wants here in just a second. But I got that game in. Uh, I think that was the second game I played. Uh, I played uh, Nid of Valir. Me and uh, Jim, James Odak, uh, played uh, Nid of Valir. I've played Nid of Valir uh, a couple of times in person with four players. I played it on BGA several times with four players. I did not realize how quick that game goes with two players. Jim and I were looking to do something in under an hour, and he's like, 
like, hey, let's let's grab this one. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I can jump right in. I said, but this, you know, tends to be an hour game. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, two player will knock this out quick. And I'd say we played it probably about 30, 45 minutes. It was surprising how quick that game goes with two players, but very solid uh, drafting game. A lot of fun there. Uh, played the networks. I mentioned that one before. Uh, we had four or five of us play in the network, so it was a five-player game in the networks. That was fun. We played that probably about an hour and a half, taught a couple new people out how to play, and then the game I got roped into the late one was Western Legends, which I like a lot. I don't think I've ever played with six. I've played with five before, and I remember that being a long experience. That was years ago, but we played with six, and like I say, about four hours into it, about 2 in the morning, 2, 2.30 in the morning, we decided to call it, And uh, but uh, still a, a lot of fun. I like that game. This is a game actually that Carlos had owned before, and I played the copy uh, that he sold to uh, Brian Zeno, uh, and uh, we played it with uh, the, uh, the Annie Up expansion, um, Did and, not sell, uh, traded, yeah. trade. Oh, traded. Oh, uh, Zeno kept saying he bought it, so that's where I was actually I meant to mention that because he kept saying, "Hey, I bought this and I bought this off of." Carlos. I got, I got, com- so. I got some more command and colors off of him. Yep, just for that trade, I think it was worth it. But yeah, so I got those five games in. Uh, you just played a couple of games, didn't you, Carlos? Uh, a couple as in one, yeah. Oh, was it just one? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I did, sure so I did the flea market, the and that went yeah. long, right? So yeah. I don't think I was done with that to like closer to two. Yeah. And then uh, it's, it was my wife's birthday weekend. So I had said, listen, depending on how we do on the flea market, that's going to dictate what we eat. So a flea market went really well. Like I was, I was really astonished how the slate coasters did. And I spent a lot of energy and effort trying to figure out how to etch laser on slate. And Rob's has seen a lot of the progress. Like he's seen the hot garbage that I started was making. And then like the quality of the, of the, the gray scaling that I'm able to get on, on the, on the slate etching now. But those coasters flew. They were gone. Poor Zeno. He and I were sharing the table. And he's like, I can't sell any of these 3D things that I'm printing. But you're here just selling coasters. They're just <laughs> flying off the table. So we took all that money and went to uh, went to lunch, came back. And I brought some beignets with me. So Because I went to uh, Walk-On's, which is a Louisiana restaurant. Uh, beignets, beignets are like what I call yeah, I have- a, a Creole donut. Yeah, yeah, donut with some powdered sugar on it. Uh, you can't go bad, oh, just so frying bad. dough. But then you brought me half of a uh, of a double decker. Uh, oh, what you think of that burger? Well, yeah, I wish that was pretty dang good. Actually, I was. Uh, I know you mentioned to me your wife eats it with no uh, no toppings on it, so there was no mustard, no mayo, no nothing. It was just plain. It had uh, just cheese and bacon on it, and I was surprised at how good it was with just cheese and bacon on. It. That was a good burger. And then the it's a Louisiana restaurant, so throwback to the uh, last time we went to the con out the Southern Board Game Fest. In Louisiana, I was drinking a Beta uh, Purple Haze and the uh, Beta uh, Ale that they have out there. So it's all Louisiana style uh, with beignets and po' boys. I had a po' boy for lunch. It was great. It was, and that's you know that's awesome, being able to go to the con and get some good food and not have to leave the site, the parking lot. So that, that was awesome. But what I didn't know, and this is what really surprised me, is every day on the Facebook they posted about snacks being put out. I'm like, okay. Well, here we were. I come back from the restaurant stuffed. And there are buffet tables of food in the hall, brownies, cookies, cakes, pretzel, uh, uh, like like pretzel sticks, uh, meatballs on skewers, you know, all these. And I'm like, and everybody's just pounding down, man. I'm like, man, had I known this was coming at this level, I wouldn't have eaten as much or wouldn't have gone to eat because I could have just ate for free. Yeah, I was going to that, say that's, that's awesome. I saw those photos and I was like impressed because like. Most conventions don't give most like non-professional conventions like nerd cons, I guess you call them. They don't do free food like that. I mean, that was like those. That looks some good food out laid out there. That like you could for the value of your ticket, if that was included, that's a pretty nice little added bonus of having some snacks and you know so you can you can game all day. Maybe you don't have to go out and spend a two hour hour and a half because anytime you go out, it's going to be an hour or two before to go right. out get food come Just back leaving eating and coming back. Yeah, so, I know yeah, that's, uh, I was talking to Jim there, and he made a comment that, uh, you know, again, I don't know, it, it may not have actually been something that uh, that uh, they were wanting. I don't remember there being food like that before, now that I think about it, the last couple of uh, times we've been out there to the escape winter. But Jim had said that uh, Patrick maybe had mentioned that that's something that the the location, the uh, venue was requiring him to do. That was part of the package that uh, the, on top of the hotel rooms, he had to purchase a certain amount of catered food. And so that was that was kind of part of that deal. And from what I understand, that may not have been Patrick's preference to do that, but it, it was a requirement. So for better or for well, worse. I'll tell you, though, the last time I got fed like that yeah. was at Dice Tower Con because they had a spread like that for breakfast. 
yeah. when Patrick ran it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Exactly. So like I, you know, a I, I, I don't know how he negotiated it, how that business deal happened, but you know, twelve year old Fat Carlos was super happy you know, inside me, smiling at the brownie table, just enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, just knowing that the the number of conventions that I work for my profession, like my professional and nonprofit work, um, normally there's like a food and beverage minimum and a hotel night minimum that you, in your contracts. So if you're not going to have any food and beverage minimum, normally they increase the amount of hotel nights you have to do. Or in order to get the conference room or the ballroom for free, you have to use so much food and beverage. So if you pay, if you don't do food and beverage, and you got to pay for the hotel, the the convention. So there's all kinds of like room nights Trade-off. versus getting the rooms for free versus AV versus food. And in the contract, you'll have like a sliding scale between those four or five things that you have to do depending on how many people you have and how many nights you have and those kind of things. So it's interesting. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it makes sense. A full library, full game library, a whole separate room, yep. check in and out games. So, I mean, you get that full game library experience that you don't get at Dragon Con because they just don't have it like that. But like a Dice Tower-esque game room uh, with a game library. They did have shows. There were people hosting shows, Rob, before we got there uh, on the weeknights. So Thursday and Friday night, there were events. There were shows that were being hosted. So entertainment was being provided. And uh, they do the raffles. They have that the, the HQ table area where they got the, the raffle thing. And you can you get two tickets just for being an attendee. And then you can buy more tickets. I know our buddy uh, uh, Jim James Odak uh, purchased a whole bunch of extra tickets and ended up walking away with like 100 bucks in gift certificates. Yeah, uh, one, one of uh, the members of the Media Dice Steve. community, Steve, uh, yeah. walked away with everything, uh, um, everything, terraforming Mars, terraforming Mars, all the all expansions, the expansions and everything. Yep. So uh, I, I unfortunately didn't win anything, but yeah. So <laughs> the, the, those are the fun things that I remember from like the Dice Tower days, like you know, yeah. looking for your ticket, waiting to see the being being called, the food, the atmosphere. It although it was a small con, at five hundred people. Uh, I'm going to say that the experiences that you got there was the full con experience. The shows, the food, the people, the game rooms, the libraries, the different sections of areas that are doing different things, the flea market, the virtual flea market, you know, games being hosted, teach me signs, play with me signs, all the hot tables, all that experience that you get at a bigger con, you can experience at Escape Winter Con. I'm really hoping to see you all out there in February. I'm happy because February is easier for me than September for gaming. So when COVID hit and they had to move it to September the last two years, it made it harder for me to get out there. But being in February, it's uh, we got two birthdays for our boys in February. That's the excuse to go get a hotel in Orlando for a week. Right? That That's the reason to go take a week's vacation, celebrate the kids' birthdays, let them go do Disney or the water parks while I get some gaming in. And we spend a week at the hotel, so I'm really looking forward to this next February event. So if I had to rate it, buy, try, or deny on Escape WinterCon, I'm going to call it a, a buy. The value, the location, and the experiences that you get, to me, uh, have been wholly worth it. Yeah, it's a good time. And I think that's cool, is, is you can get uh, different experiences at different size conventions, but ultimately, you kind of get the same experience at, at, at every convention. You just get what you get out of it, right? And I think for those of you who haven't been to conventions, maybe listen to this, you have to decide sort of what you want out of a convention, right? So if you want to go to a Dragon Con or you want to go to Escape Winter Con and you want to game and do nothing but game, then then go do that, right? But if you want to go to the shows and you want to do the dealer room or you like go to Dragon Con, I want to go do music, I want to go do celebrities, just you plan that ahead of time and then just make your decision, though, like this is what I'm going to do. So like I a long time ago, like I said, I, I, I've made Dragon Con my – ultimate other nerdy con i do everything else but gaming there but then i go to other local conventions i go to necronomicon i'm going to go to your turn con i'm going to hopefully go to dice tower next year those are going to be the cons where i'm going to game and i'm going to be there from 6 a.m to midnight every time gaming right so it's like really just you have to figure out what you want to get out of a convention and then just stick to it don't you know and, and then but realize that you know you could do something one year and then the next year do something different at that same con so you can vary it up and if you go every year don't feel bad if you miss out on something one year because you'll get you'll get a similar experience or a different experience next year. God willing. Yeah, well said. Well, that's going to wrap us up for our main topic. You know, this is, we promise it to be an espresso style episode, something quick, cafecito, real fast, real strong, real dark and sweet, just like me. Look at that. Sure. 
So don't forget to catch us on our Thursday night live call in show every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, whether it's me, Rob, Mitchell, Wayne. Some of us are going to be there running that show and getting those phone calls in. And uh, the podcast has been releasing lately once a week. We're running on a one, once a week podcast. Um, so check out your podcast subscriber. Make sure your subscription is up and you hit subscribe to our podcast. Provide feedback for us at on our Discord. We have a channel on our Discord for Beans and Dice where you can talk to us about this episode. What were your thoughts? What were your experiences? And chat with us on the Facebook community. So there's plenty of ways to find us for the Beans and Dice community. So on that note, uh, I'm Carlos. I'm Rob. And I'm Wayne. And we are the Beans and Dice podcast. We are a podcast about how How we game. game.